As I look around this world, I see the lost and hopeless souls, a place where love and kindness seldom can be seen. Redemption can be had by calling on Christ's name. Give your heart to Jesus, you'll be free. And I love you, Lord, I need you, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Come and change my life, take my soul, give me grace to help a lost and hopeless world. The blood of the Savior will wash you clean. Get down shame, take away the chain. Your burdens will be lifted and your heart filled with joy. Your life change and by calling on Christ's name. And I love you, Lord. I need you, Lord. For your name is great and greatly to be praised. Come and change my life. Take my A lost and hopeless world Give me grace to help A lost and hopeless world Give me grace to help A lost and hopeless world Amen. Amen. Thank you. That's Tony Adams singing one of his original songs. I'm preaching this morning from John chapter 20, so look in your Bibles for those of you that are here. Look in your Bibles to John chapter 20 and verse number 30. I'll take two verses today, and as I said, I want to preach on this subject, preaching like Jesus. How did Jesus preach to reach the multitudes for Christ? And welcome to all of you who are watching uh, and listening around the world on Facebook Live. And we thank God for you. We'd like to hear from you. And all you have to do for us to know that you're watching is to say like. It says down there at the bottom, like. And if you like us, well, I want you to say that so we'll know that uh, uh, you're listening across the country and around the world. And we've got a full house here today at First Baptist Church of South Beaches in Melbourne Beach, Florida. And that's the group that I'm really going to be preaching to this morning on about Jesus. And I want to read John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The Bible, of course, according to the words that we've just read, uh, was written so that you and I could understand that Jesus came into this world to die and shed his blood on Calvary's cross that we might be saved. In other words, that's the mission of the church, is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody that they might have an opportunity to be saved. So in every message, you know, uh, we ought to tell folks that we're all sinners and every one of us need to come to the knowledge of Christ as our Savior and that we can be saved simply by putting our faith and trust in Him 
asking him to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and then uh, to ask him to come into our heart and save us. And he did say that, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I want to talk about Jesus today because he's really the central theme of all of life and how he went about uh, teaching and preaching the things of God. One time way back yonder in Texas, in Fort Worth, I was at a big meeting of a bunch of Baptist people, and one of the guys who was there was Dallas Billington. His name was Dallas Billington, and he was pastor of a great church in Akron, Ohio. And by the way, back even in 1948, he had over 10,000 people in Sunday school. The first building that they built at that church, they had to build it to seat a thousand people. It was back whenever, you know, the automobile business was really going good, and they had all those tire companies there, Firestone and Goodyear, and thousands and thousands of people were moving up from Kentucky and Virginia and all those places to work in those big factories. And many of them were born-again Christians, and a lot of them got saved after they got there. And I asked him, I said, well, what... To, what did you, how do you, what was, I was a young preacher, you know, pastor of a little church, and he said, I said, well, what, to, what would you advise me to do? He said, I'd advise you to just to be, do like Jesus did. And I said, dumb, I didn't even know what Jesus did, you know, so I said, well, what did Jesus do? He said, he just went ever, everywhere telling people how to be saved, how to come to know him as their own personal Savior, and that's what we ought to do. We ought to be going everywhere telling everybody that Jesus Christ is Lord and we need to put our faith and trust in Him. One of the things that Jesus did that is, is absolutely, uh, a, I think, a great help and a hope, and that is that He told stories. Everywhere you go, you remember the stories that He told about in verse, uh, Mark chapter 4 and verse uh, 34, He said, But without, uh, without a parable spake not unto them, he spake not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Jesus spoke with parables. You couldn't do this today, but he told things uh, that really wasn't true. Uh, he made up a story uh, as, as a parable, and a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, you know. And so he would make up a story uh, so that uh, it didn't necessarily happen. It could have happened. But it might not have happened, like for instance the prodigal son, and uh, he, he told about the prodigal son and all about him leaving and going into a far country, and then how he came back to his father and how he was received and all of those things. That was a story that illustrated a great truth. He could have just said, God loves you so much, he will welcome you back to him no matter how far you have wandered away. But he thought, I'll just tell a story to illustrate this and make it a little easier for people to understand. And I'll be honest with you, the women can go with me just talking to them, but if I tell an illustration, the men will get the message too. You know, the men need some help up there getting the message. And an illustration really helps the men, you know. And so it helps me, and so that's how I know that. Jesus told a story from everyday life to teach a spiritual truth about the prodigal son. Not only that, he told the story about the lost coin. He told the story about the lost sheep. All of these were stories. He, and I could tell you a bunch more uh, that he told, but all of these were stories. And I love to tell stories myself because I, I really do know that uh, when you tell a story, it really and truly solidifies that truth in the hearts of people. They can really see it. Uh, just like if you were here this morning, I used a really uh, an illustration uh, actually, I used the illustration, but I used a, a, a $10 bill, and I wanted it all up, you know, and, and just wanted it as tight as I could get it, and I said, is, is this still valuable? And everybody else was here, everybody said, yes, it is. Uh, even though it's f wanted up, it's still valuable. You can just pull it back out, and even if one part of it's cut off, you, it's still $10, and that's the way it is with a person that, uh, that gets away from the Lord. They may be messed up, but they're still of the Lord's, and they're still valuable, and God said they can be restored back to Him. He, Jesus did another thing. He said things to shock people. He used hyperbole, you know, 
And we use hyperbole a lot, especially raising kids, you know. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. If you don't behave, I'm going to lock you out of the house. If you don't get uh, hurry up and get ready, I'm going to leave you at home. Have you ever told your kids that? Don't tell <laughs> stuff like that because you're not going to do it. And they, not, they know you're not going to do all that. And uh, so, but we do sometimes use Jesus. Remember when he, when he was uh, preaching uh, the Sermon on the Mount? And he said, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Whoo, that's rough, isn't it? If your hand offends you, cut it off. You said, Lord, yeah. That's, that's, that's hyperbole. In other words, he said, if you're stealing something all the time, find yourself stealing, said, quit stealing. Right. If you're looking at things you ought not to look at, like pornography and stuff like that, quit watching it. And then if, he said this one, one time. He said, unless you hate your mother and father and follow me, you can't be in the kingdom of God. Well, you say, man, I can't believe he told me to hate my mom and daddy. I can't do that. What he, what he said was, using this hyperbole, your love for me ought to be so great that your love for your mom and daddy seems like hate. You love Jesus so much. I never will forget my son... Uh, this is a long time ago, uh, Noel, when he was only five years old. And we used to have a, an old car, I think it was a Rambler. And it had the, the drive shaft, it wasn't really a car, it was a Rambler, it was a Nash. And uh, you remember they had the drive shaft that went all the way through the back, you know? And, and, and uh, he was standing, this was back before we had seat belts and baby carriages and stuff. And um, so he would stand on that right between his mother and I. And he said this on the way home from church one day. He said, Daddy, he said, do you care if I love Jesus more than I love you? I said, no, son, I sure don't. I don't care. We ought to love Jesus with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind, and with all that is within us. And then... We need to love our neighbor as ourself. But yeah. our love for our family ought to even seem like hate. We love Jesus so much. Mm -hmm. We still, you know, you're never going to hate your mom and daddy. I'll promise you that, regardless of the situation. Remember, uh, he said, cut your hand off and cut your eye out. And, and that's one of those things in, that each and every... And I, here's another one. I just uh, wrote this down, too, and I forgot I'd written it down. He said, you know, not one sparrow falls to the ground that he doesn't take note of it. I mean a sparrow full of mites, you know. People want to kill him. Not one sparrow falls to the ground until he takes notice of it. And then here's the hyperbole. He said, you are more important than many sparrows. Think about it. We're more important than a sparrow <laughs> in the eyes of God. In other words, that's really how much he loved us. He loves us with all of his heart, with all his soul. He said the hairs of your head are numbered. Woo, he's, he's going to have to count mine every day when I take a shower. Because most of them, he's going to have to go in our shower. Because every once in a while we have to unstop that thing. You know, where I'm hair down there like crazy. Well, that's hyperbole. He, he doesn't count your hair every day. But he does love you enough and knows enough about He knows every detail about you. You can't hide from God. That's what that means. You cannot hide from God. Don't even try because wherever you go, you say, well, I'm going to run away from God like Jonah did. Well, if you do, you're going to be going down, down, down. Remember, he went down to Joppa, down to the seashore, down in the boat, and then down in the water, and the, down in the belly of the whale. Every time you try to leave the Lord, but in every place, even when he was in the belly of the whale, he finally came to himself and he said, Salvation is of the Lord. And he said, Lord, if you'll raise me from the dead, I'll do what you want me to do. He couldn't get away from God. God was wherever you are. You can't get away from God. Jesus was the kind of guy that he liked to craft uh, sayings. He liked to give you something, you know, that you could remember yeah. the sermon by. And uh, one of the things that everybody loves today is uh, judge not lest you be judged. You know, judge not lest you be judged. 
And uh, it didn't say you shouldn't judge anybody. It says, you know, you're going to be judged yourself. And so you got to be careful about judging others. Judge not lest you be judged. Oh, people love that, don't they? And he said another one. He said uh, the golden rule, you know, it came from God. Uh, and and it's, uh, he said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You say, well, that's not in the Bible. Well, I know it, but here in Luke chapter 6 and verse 31, he said, as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Now, doesn't that mean do unto others as you'd have them do unto you? He, he, he loved to say things that would cause people uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to remember it, to remember it. Uh, this, remember that sermon where Jesus said, you know, uh, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you? Remember that sermon where Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged? Remember that sermon where Jesus said, nothing is impossible with God? Woo! Nothing. That's in Matthew nineteen twenty six. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen. Those are some of the things, and there's hundreds and hundreds of other things that Jesus said that was uh, would let us know something we could take home with us. You know, something that uh, Brother Puffer or maybe Brother Tony could write a song about. You know, they'd hear that one little phrase that this this really personifies the message. And it would be one that you could write a song about. Another thing that Jesus did when he was going uh, was um, he would ask questions. He said um, uh, in Matthew 16, 26, For what is man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or, another question, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? That's a question. That, ma that makes us think, doesn't it? Here's a question. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What would it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In other words, uh, the most important thing is what this means. The most important thing that you will ever do in your life was to come to know Jesus as your personal Savior. Because if you're like Bloomberg, worth $50 million, and you're going to spend $1 billion of your own money to try to knock Trump out of office, you're still going to hell if you have not trusted Jesus right. Christ right. as your personal Savior. Yeah. Because that's the most important thing. What should it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What do you think? See, that's one thing that we've lost a little bit in this country. I remember when I was raised, and of course I know I'm getting up there in years a little bit, but when I was raised, we were taught to respect human life. But now, since we've killed in this country millions and millions of babies before pre-born babies, I guarantee you one thing, if they hadn't have killed them, they would have been born and they would have lived. You, if you have to kill something, it was alive. Remember that? Yeah, yeah it was alive. And so, uh, I think that's really hurt us. We found, we felt these young kids growing up felt that life wasn't really that valuable. We kill them, just slaughter them every day by the thousands. And so, young people get a gun, and then maybe some of the times these video games have done something to help it because, you know, they'll kill 50 people and then all of a sudden those people will get up and be in there the next game. The same people. And they think, well, it's not final. It's not. Listen, when somebody dies, that's final. They are gone from this earth forever to spend eternity in heaven or hell. Let's, let's respect human life. We'd never know probably how valuable human life was if Jesus had never come and told us that Jesus, that God loved us so much that He was willing to give His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth, He gave us His own Son, His precious darling Son, to die in our place. He said, when we were sorry, no good sinners, He still loved us enough to give His Son to die in our place. That shows you how 
how bad sin is, that it needed a Savior, shows you how much God loves us in that He was willing to give His own Son so that we would have an opportunity to be saved. Listen, it's a tremendous thing when you come to those. And the question is, He said, uh, they asked Him, you know, this was a question they asked Him. And He answered back, said, uh, are you going to pay your taxes? And He said, I want to ask you to show me a coin. And then on the coin, he, uh, he said, uh, whose is the image and superscription? And they said, unto him, Caesar's. Thou sayest, he, uh, and he said unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Yeah. There's another you know, uh, saying that he created, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God. In other words, pay your taxes. <laughs> Should we pay our taxes? Who's, whose picture's on that thing? Well, it's Caesar. Well, pay your taxes then. Pay, uh, if, you, if you have taxes to pay, pay them. Hope you get a refund. They said the average person gets a refund of, I think, $2,800, and I hope all of you do. I don't. <laughs> i got to pay it. <laughs> you know how it is. But anyway, the thing of it is, uh, questions sometimes are the best answer. When somebody asks you a question, ask them a question. And that sometimes gets the best answer right there. Number five. I didn't know I had so many points, but number five, <laughs> Jesus used object lessons. Don't you just love object lessons? And you say, oh, that's for kids. Just like we sang, Jesus loves me. And you say, oh, that's for kids. No. I tell you, after I heard that song in Bible study this morning, I thought, man, what a profound statement. You know, that is. That Jesus Christ loves us. The Bible tells me so and all that. You know, what a blessing that is. That, read those all three of those verses and you'll get a theology lesson. I'll guarantee you that right there in that little song. My, my, uh, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. And uh, I don't think that's that one, is it? But I'll guarantee you what a blessing that is. I'll be question. Remember when he washed the disciples' feet? Uh, what a lesson. That was a lesson in humility. A lesson in humility. He humbled himself and washed the disciples' feet. Now, I don't want nobody washing my feet. The, the, the worst memory I can ever remember in grade school was in the second grade, and Mrs. Burris, I'll see her in heaven. She's been long gone because you know, you know how old she'd be if she's still alive when I was in the second grade. But anyway, <laughs> she said, we're going to weigh everybody today on these scales and everybody's got to take their shoes off. I said, I'm not taking my shoes off. She said, yeah, you're going to take your shoes off. And I took my shoe off, and I had a big old hole, and my big old toe was sticking right through it. And I've never been so embarrassed in all my life. I'll never forget that, and I'm about 70-something years old. Yeah, and more, I think, probably. But <laughs> I will never forget that. As long as I live. That was an object lesson that I, oh, be careful about asking kids to do things. Because we were poor and we didn't have much of this world's goods. We had plenty to eat because we lived on a farm. My dad was a railroad man, but back in the old days, they made 10 cents an hour, you know, uh, during the days that I'm talking about. And so uh, the truth of it is, don't, uh, don't try not to embarrass somebody if you can help it. I hate pranks worse than anybody right here in this room mm. because I don't want to be embarrassed. <coughs> yeah, I don't like it. I hate embarrassment. And I hate, uh, oh, I don't like for anybody to be, because a lot of times pranks result, it's supposed to be funny, but it actually hurts somebody's feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't like that. So, but Jesus used uh, the disciples. He, uh, that's the reason I don't want you to wash my feet. But he used that as an example of humility, an object lesson. This is what, what do you mean by humble yourselves before my, well, here it is, I'll wash your feet. I'll wash your feet. Some people take that to believe they ought to wash the feet of everybody in the church, you know, as part of the uh, Lord's Supper. But uh, they don't do it right, you know. Everybody that I've ever seen does that. Uh, they always wash their feet really, really good, and they always have a pan of water for everybody and a fresh and everything and so uh, I think y'all just wash the dirty feet say nobody wash your feet today I want to wash them for you and you say oh no you're not either but Jesus used that as a great lesson object lesson what about the widow you remember Jesus I hate 
Every time you take an offering like that, Jesus is watching. Yeah, see, see how much you put in. He knows how much you put in. Because here's a woman, and they had, they had the treasury, and Jesus standing over against the treasury, and uh, they, they come by and put their money in. And these rich men would come, they'd put in $100. I've had millionaires in my churches, and they'd give like $100 a week. And they, you know, and I'd have a poor little old woman uh, making $400 on Social Security come in and give $40. I told her, I said, you don't need to give anything, you know. I, I lied to her because she did, because, you know, God will bless you if you tithe. I don't care if you don't make but 200 a week. But anyway, the point is that, uh, that um, when this little lady come by, she put in two mites. That's about one penny if you add them both together. And you know what Jesus said? He said, now, hey, these rich people come by and they put in out of their abundance. She gave all that she had. Now, that was an object lesson. Yeah. That it's not the size of the offering, but it's what you have, what you feel in your heart. You know? She was willing to give it all. You know, that's what... I remember a preacher, a friend of mine was preaching down in Texas and he's going to be with the Lord now and he was uh, he, he was talking about the, the Lord could come back at any time and then he said, I'm going to take an offering and he said, I want you all to give this offering because if the Lord's come back, you're going to leave it for the devil. And uh, so one man stood up in the back. He said, Preacher, you want us to give this offering to you? And he said, Yes. He said, If the Lord comes back, you won't have any use for it either. <laughs> so that's pretty good. I like that one. I heard this preacher one time. He said, uh, Put your billfold on the radio, and God will fill it. This is a, t a radio preacher back in the day. I said to that preacher, Why don't you put your billfold on? on the radio and let God feel it there at the house you know you don't have to have, I think that was a way to raise money but Jesus used object lessons and I won't go in any further but he did use a lot of object lessons lastly and here's something that people always criticize me for preachers for I guess is he used repetition he said things over and over uh, two or three times just so that the people would really get it he spoke of uh, his death and his resurrection a lot of times he would say that many times. He said in Mark 8, 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said it again in Mark 9, 31. That's one chapter later. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. And he said it again in the 10th chapter of Mark. Verse 33, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. And that's really our message today. Over and over again, we ought to tell the people. And they say, oh, that's shallow preaching. It is theology 101. It's theology 1017. I'm telling you that Jesus came, that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus arose triumphant over death, hell, and the grave, and that Jesus was upon this earth alive 40 days and was is seen by many brethren, as many as 500 at one time. And then he ascended into heaven. And remember, the angel said to the disciples, the apostles, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into the heavens? The same Jesus that you see going away is coming back in like manner as you've seen him go away. Which means that one day Jesus is coming back bodily to this earth to rule and to reign for a thousand years and then forever of course as the son of God or as God the son that came and lived and suffered and died so that we might all have everlasting life I think that's a good picture a little bit of a picture of the life that Jesus lived and how he preached and talked uh, while he was here upon earth and it might be a good way for us to be a witness for Christ out here in the world today let's bow our heads for a word of prayer